crazy homeless episode that he made. He had an episode before, but uh, he used to live in the back. There actually is two apartment buildings behind me, there, so he used to live here. Amen. All right, turn to Matthew 8 and 24. Matthew 8 and 24. We're going to, uh, when you got to say amen, if you ain't got to say holy. Today we're going to talk about faith, faith, faith. Now we're going to talk about faith through works. Faith through works. All right, Matthew 8 and 24 says this. I need to get it. Matthew 8 and 24. I am tripping. Here we go. All right, Matthew 8 and 24. It says, And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, inasmuch that the ship was covered by waves. But Jesus was asleep. Verse 25. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, Lord, save us, or we're going to perish. Verse 26, and he woke, and he said unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he got up out of his bed and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So Jesus and his disciples, they were in a boat, they were in a boat, they were in a boat, and they were going somewhere. They were traveling, traveling, traveling. Long story short, there was a storm. There was a storm. Uh, imagine this. What is a storm? Rain, snow, hail, wind, anything that can hurt you or harm you. This should turn up a little bit. Anything that can hurt you or harm you. There was a storm. And when there was this storm, the disciples got scared because they did not know what was happening. Now, imagine this. A storm. What is a storm? What is a storm? A storm is anything that is uncomfortable to you. That's a storm. Some of you are going through a storm, a financial storm. Amen. That means your finances are messed up. Some of you are going through a health storm. You might be, uh, Pastor Eric talked about when his relatives is in the hospital with cancer. That's a storm of health. Some of you have relationship storms. There was a storm on the ship. And the disciples were sore afraid. And But the thing about them was, when they got scared, unlike us, they didn't go pick up the blunt, they didn't go pick up the bottle, they didn't go pop the pills, they, did, they didn't go get the tattoos on their arm, they ran and they went to Jesus. Imagine that. When there was a storm, they ran and they went to Jesus. Now when they got to Jesus, Jesus started talking to him. And he's like, first of all, I was asleep. And then he says, what y'all waking me up for? And then they said, there was a storm. And then he looked at the storm, and he says, this is nothing but a little thing. Then he says, oh, ye of little faith. And what does that mean? That means if your faith is small, the storms in your life seem greater. If you have little faith, the things in your life will seem so big. But if you have faith, then you can overcome anything that comes your way. See, if you have little faith, then the storms look big, and they look mighty, and the test looks strong, and they look like you can never get through it. But if you have faith, anything is possible. The Bible says all things are possible when Jesus Christ is your source. I can do all things through Jesus Christ, who strengthens me. When you have faith, anything is possible. So step out in faith. Step out in faith. Step out in faith. Uh, next, turn with me to Nehemiah. Nehemiah. That's in the Old Testament. Turn up a little bit more. Bishop. Nehemiah 6 and 12. Nehemiah 6 and 12. Nehemiah 6. And put us in the Old Testament. Amen. Nehemiah 6 and 12. Nehemiah 6 and 12 says this. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me for Tobiah and Sembalat had hired him. I'm going to translate all this. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and to do so and to sin that they might have 
the, a matter of an evil report that they might reproach me. Let me read that again. And we'll put it all together. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me for Tobiah and for Sambalat, who had hired him. I'm going to translate all that. Therefore he was hired that I should be afraid. Put a pin in that. Therefore he was hired so that I would be afraid. And to do so, and to sin, that they might be able to accuse me of an ill report that would cause me harm. All right. There was a man named Nehemiah. Nehemiah, that's his name, Nehemiah. Long story short, Nehemiah was charged with building a wall for his people. Now, that might not seem like much to you today. But you live, how many of you live in a home that got security bars on it? Raise your hand. You got security bars on your home. How many of you live in a home with an alarm? We have an alarm system. And we got a big old ugly dog. That's our alarm. And he killed everything that comes through the gate. All right. So we have, we have a dog and we have a security system. Uh, some of y'all live in homes with bars. Now, in this town, which was a city, they didn't have bars. What they would do was they would build walls. They would build a wall. And the wall would be to protect them from harm and danger, much like your alarm system, or much like my dog, or much like the bar that you put on your house. Long story short, uh, they got word they had, they had enemies. Raise your hand if you got some haters. Amen. Hey, all right. Hey, if you got haters, amen, amen. So their haters heard that they were building this wall. They heard that were, they were building this wall. And, and they knew that if the wall was built up, that they couldn't invade them anymore. They couldn't break into their places anymore. They couldn't hurt them anymore. So Nehemiah, he was charged with building his wall. But the haters start speaking to you, speaking to him. Be careful when people that do not like you start being nice. Be careful that when people that who do not like you start being nice. Because they didn't like him, but then they start speaking sweet to him. Hey, how you doing, Nehemiah? Oh, we heard about your wall, man. And then they start telling him, you don't need that wall no more. And then they start telling him, hey, man, you know what? Well, we okay. And then they start telling him, you know, you can go into the church and hide. That was interesting. They told him that you don't need this wall anymore. In fact, they told him to go into the church. And if you went to this church, you could hide. I encourage you to read Nehemiah 6. It's a great story. So Nehemiah says, wow. He started to become afraid because all the news that he heard was bad. He heard that if he built this wall, it would be a bad thing. He heard that something was coming and that if he didn't prepare himself, that it would hurt him. But what Nehemiah said here in verse 12, he said this, he said this, he said this, and lo, I perceived that God had not sent them, and he pronounced this prophecy for, for Sanballat and Tobiah, and that they, they had been hired. Let me read it from the Living Bible Translation. He says, then I realized that God had not spoken to him, but that he was hired by my enemies to make me sin by fleeing into the church. So what was the point here? Who is your source of reference when you run into trouble? Who is it that you listen to when you run into bad situations? Who do you turn to when stuff is going bad in your life? And that's very important. Because sometimes you're going to run into some crazy situations in life. Uh, when Pastor Eric got the news about his relative that, that had died, the first thing he did, he called me. Who do you call when hell is running through your life? Who do you call when you don't understand what's going on? Because some of us call the wrong people. And when you call the wrong people, you get the wrong information, and you end up doing the wrong thing. This man, he turned to the church. And this, this man, he turned to God. He listened to the word of God. See, the thing about the word of God is this. Jesus does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Men change like the wind. Uh, what was good 10 years ago is bad today. What's bad 10 years ago is good today. When I was growing up, sagging your pants was a bad thing. Today, sagging your pants is a good thing. The things change in, in our reality. But God is consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You need to resource people who are connected to God. You need to reach out to people who are connected to God. Next, turn with me. Turn me to Jeremiah 17 and 5. Jeremiah 17 and 5. Jeremiah 17 
and 5. Jeremiah 17 and 5. Jeremiah 17 and 5 says this, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh his flesh his arm, and whose heart departed from the Lord. For he shall be like a heath in the desert, and shall not see when the good cometh, but he shall inhabit the dry places in the wilderness, a salt land that is not inhabited. So it says, those who trust in man shall be cursed. It says, if you listen to the words of man, you will be cursed. If you follow the directives of man, you will be cursed. This is not me speaking. This is Bible. Let's keep reading. Verse 7. Verse 7 says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river. And he shall not see when the heat cometh, but her leaf shall always be green. And he shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall he cease from yielding fruit. And then verse 9 said, The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately weak, wicked, who can know it? So the thing is, blessed is the man who trusteth in God, who trusteth in the word of God. Cursed is the man who trusteth in man. What does that mean? If you start listening to your friends for advice, your life will end up like theirs. Oftentimes, the reason why so many people get cancer is because we all do the same thing. Oftentimes, we end up in negative situations because we're following other people who are just as blind as you are. The Bible says, how can the blind lead the blind and they not both fall in the ditch? But the Bible says, what we should do is trust God. When in doubt, trust God. When it doesn't make sense, trust God. When you, when you can't figure this thing out, trust God. Look to God. Don't look to man when you are in a bad situation. When your relationship is on the rocks, look to God. Don't look to man. When, when you can't figure out how you're going to pay your rent, look to God. Don't look to man. When you can't find a job, look to God. Don't look to man. When your health is bad, look to God. Don't look to man. You have to learn how to look to God and trust in the word of God. What was sad was we lost a, a dear car babe uh, we didn't have two weeks ago. Carl, 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 Carl. Carl got shot around the corner from here. And what's interesting about that is this. We believe that a gun can protect us. That's a lie. A gun cannot protect you, but prayer can. See, the thing is, the best weapon is the one you ain't never got to use. The best security is the one you never got to use. The best lawyer is the one you never got to use. The best health insurance is the one you never got to use. The best car insurance is the one you never got to use. You don't want to have to use something. You want God to keep you and to protect you. See, you want God to be so connected to you that he sees everything that's going on in your life that he sends angels to, to protect you when you're going through the storm. We're going to talk about that in a second. Because life is full of storms. Life is full of storms. Life is full of storms. And verse 7 and 8 says, The man who trusts God will be blessed like a tree, planted next to a flowing river. A tree has roots, and roots anchor it, and they keep it stable. Blessed is the man who trusts God. He shall be like a tree. A tree has roots, and if the roots grow down into the ground, and they drink the water, and they keep the tree strong. What does that mean? If you trust in God, you'll be stable. When everybody else got hell, you have peace. You want peace in your life. I've lived in a house where there's no peace. Woo, that ain't no fun. I've been in a situation where there's no peace. That ain't no fun. How many of y'all ever been through a situation where you was going through hell? You and y'all you, kids, you just going through hell. Hell is not fun. But God said if you trust in his word, he will give you roots. And they will dig down and they will hold you steady. Even when things are shaking around you. When there's a shaking and a rumbling going on, God will keep you stable like a rock. You want that. And you get that by trusting God, not man. We get that by trusting God, not man. Uh, look down to Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Look at Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Look at Jeremiah 17, verse 9. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Um, 
Most of y'all have had relationships. Are you in a relationship right now? I want you to think about this. Look at the people that your heart had you loving. Look at the people that your heart led you to. See, the thing is, we believe we can trust in our heart. I can trust in my emotions. I can trust in my feelings. I can trust in sensations. That's a lie. Because if you trust in the heart, you're headed for trouble. Because your heart will fool you. Because your heart is based on what's happening. It's based on emotions. And emotions is like a river. It just go backward and forward. It is here one day, it is here another day. It is all over the place. God said, you can't trust your own heart. I looked at my heart to people I dated in the past. I was like, ooh, praise the Lord, Jesus. Thank God that I had a stalker once. Say, I ain't never even told my wife this. I had a girl who used to follow me everywhere I went. It was crazy. She would call me, Michael, where I see you? I'd be like, oh my God. I had a stalker. It was crazy. I was at Compton High one time, and I saw her pull up. She was a substitute teacher. I said, Lord, have mercy. Is she going to kill me? Look at the people that your heart will get you into. Your heart will get you into trouble. God says you can't trust that heart. You got to trust him. You use God to give you discernment. See, what discernment is, is this. Discernment is, God, I'm a fool. And that's me. I, I am foolish. But you say, God, I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to pray to you. And God, I want you to lead me and help me to make decisions. You want God to speak that into you, to give you discernment, so you pick the right jobs, so you pick the right places to live, so you pick the right relationships, so you pick the right opportunities, because you have to learn how to be selective. Everything ain't good for you. And we say this in the hood, all money ain't good money. Some of y'all young ladies, you so pretty and so beautiful and, and cash at me and cash at me. You take the wrong cash app, now you connected to a fool. Because he's going to want something for his cash app advance. You got to be careful about what you do. Be selective about the decisions that you make. Next thing, next thing. Turn me to Job, Job 2 and 9. Job, we're almost done. Job 2 and 9. Job 2 and 9. Job 2 and 9. Job 2 and 9 says this. Then said his wife unto him, Does thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. I'm going to translate all that. But Job said unto her, Thou speakest as one that is foolish, woman. What shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In this did Job not sin with his lips. All right, I'm going to translate that. There's a man named Job. Raise your hand if you sort of familiar with Job. All right, we got a couple of y'all. All right. Job had an amazing life. Job was like the Huxtables. He had money. He had wealth. He had cars. He had homes. He, he had everything that a man could want. He had beautiful children. He had everything. He had finances. He was wealthy. He was well-to-do. And one day, God was talking to Satan. And he said, Satan, what's up? And Satan was like, huh, what's up, God? And then, and then God said, hey, Satan, huh, you see my boy Job over there? And then Satan looked at God and said, oh, yeah, him? That's the one you blessed. He got everything. He living good. He's prospering. He's doing everything. He, uh, you won't let me touch him, will you, God? And then God looked at Satan and said, you can have him. Imagine that. I know Job was pissed off. <laughs> Could you imagine that? Jo God allows uh, Satan to have Job. He said, you can have him. He said, the only thing you can't do is kill him. He said, hold up, hold on, hold up. Because Satan, Satan like that, he, his lips are like, <laughs> he said, hold on. You mean I can have your favorite son? He said, yeah, you can have him. He said, the only thing you can't do is kill him. He said, I can make him sick? Yep. He said, can you kill his kids? Yep. Can, can you take all his money? Yep. He took his children, murdered, took all his money, gone, took all his property, gone, made him sick. Sick like he wanted.
wanted to die. He had boils and sores all over his body. He was sick. And his wife saw all this happen. And she told him, she said, you know what, Joe? You've been a Christian all your life. You've been a disciple all your life. You might as well cuss God out and die. And Job says, woman, you is foolish. He, he said, I'll never curse God. He says, I believe in God. And he says this, God gives me good things, but he also must give me bad things. God gives me good things, but he also must give me bad things. Let, 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 let me translate that to modern English. Pain is related to gain. Pain is related to gain. What can you get good that doesn't cost you? Think about that right now. Love is one of the most expensive things on the planet. Love gonna cost. James is love expensive? Hell yeah. Uh, 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 Deacon is love expensive? Hell yeah. Uh, Eric is love expensive? Hell yeah. Hold on. I got my great right. Is love expensive? There it is. Looking right at it. That love is expensive. Love costs. So don't tell me that love, they had that song, Love is Free. Love ain't free. That's a lie. Everything that's good. Costs. An education costs. A nice home costs. A good job costs. A, a nice shoes costs. Anything that is worth having is going to cost you some pain. So the thing is, what God wants us to know is everything, pain and gain, are correlated with each other. You can't get one without the other. Look, we have this wonderful church. It's fifteen hundred dollars a month. Everything costs. So the thing is, you have to understand that. And Job explained that to his wife. Turn with me to Job 42 and 10. Job 42 and 10. We almost done, I promise you. Job 42 and 10. Job 42 and 10. Job 42 and 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Let me translate that. Uh, the Living Bible version says this. Then when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his wealth and his happiness. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as he had before. I've heard this verse most of my life. And uh, and pastor would start screaming, oh, God gave him double for his trouble. And, he was, and they would run around, ooh, and everybody would go crazy in the church, and they would go happy, and it was happy. But what we fail to realize is the principle. If you read it again, Job was suffering up until this point. But what did Job do differently this time that he had not done before? If you read it, Job prayed for his friends. When Job prayed for his friends, God released blessings and blessings and blessings upon blessings. What does that mean? Job was low. Job was like the homeless lady. Me and me, uh, my uh, nephew was driving today, and we saw a homeless lady on the bus stop, and we stopped the car. Uh, we saw two people in the situation. We stopped another car trying to help this lady. Didn't work out. So we, we stopped another time. We saw this homeless lady. We talked to her, tried to get her to church. Job was like the homeless lady that we saw on the bus stop today. He was at the lowest point in his life. Yet at his lowest point, he had the courage to pray for his friends who were in a better position. Uh, there's an old movie back in the day called, I uh, can't think of it, they sold drugs, but my wife knew it. Uh, I can't think of it right now. But one of the lines in the movie was this, am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? Jesus says, treat other people how you want to be treated. When Job's friends came to him, because he, he had a group of friends, they came to him all the time. When they came to him, they were having problems. One might have been having a marriage problem. One might have been having a problem with his business. One might have been having a health issue. And, and Job could have said, man, I'm homeless. All my kids are dead. All my money is gone. But when his friends came to him, Job said, hey, hey, brother, you something wrong? Let me pray for him. He reached out his hand. And he covered him. He prayed for him. His other friend came. His brother friend had more money than him, and he prayed for him, and he covered him. God says, treat people how you want to be treated. And when he did that thing, 
it opened up the windows of heaven. And he had twice as much as he had before. What is the message for you? Start praying for your brothers and sisters. Look out for one another. Reach out to each other. Be an open ear to somebody that's in need. Don't always make it always about you. Because God wants you to realize that the blessings come not for you. The blessings come is when you look out for somebody else. In fact, in Matthew 25 and 40, it says, What you have done unto the least of them, you have done unto me. God says you are blessed when you reach down and you help. It's better to be a lender than a borrower. What that means is it's better to give than to receive. Because when you give, the blessings come back triple and double. When you keep for yourself, you limit your blessings. You limit the things that God can do. Uh, I remember my old pastor to do this. He says, what can you put in a closed hand? Nothing. If you, everything about you is closed up, nothing can come in. It's just a fix. It's just a fix. But when you open your hand, you open the door for opportunity. When you open your hands to somebody else, you open the windows of heaven for God to fill this hand with something that you can bless somebody else with. And my brother-in-law, Luther King, he goes out every day. Big Boo is what we call him. You, you see him come here and he say a couple words like a football coach and he run out the door. But what he does every night, he's a poor man. He ain't rich. Luther's poor. I love you, brother. I know he watches every sermon. He's poor. But if he have a sandwich, he'll cut it in half and he'll give it to somebody who has nothing. If he have a, a t-shirt, he'll take his t-shirt and he'll give it to a homeless person. If he have a blanket on his bed, he'll take the blanket off his bed, fold it up, and take it around the corner and give it to somebody and watch. And he does this every day with no money, no resources. And what's interesting is, the more he gives, the more he receives. The more he gives, the more he receives. The more he gives, the more God gives him to give. And some of us said, that's foolish. I wouldn't do that. But see, the thing is, if you give like him, in the next life, which is what we're all living for here, you'll be so blessed. And not only is Luther King blessed here, he's been honored at the Chargers game, he's been honored by the Lakers, he's been, because the Bible says your gift will bring you before great men. Do what God's called you to do. My son right here, he's a giver. John Heath, give him a hand clap. Hallelujah! John Heath is a great giver. Now, he's crazy as hell. My son is a psychopath, but I love him, but he's a giver. Omega is a giver. Another crazy one. Give Omega a hand clap. Hallelujah. Trey is a giver. These men, young men who are givers, they see people in need and they reach out. And that's powerful because these are kids, essentially, they're 20 years old, less than 20 years old, but they're gift. They recognize that I can be of value to somebody who has nothing. That's crazy. You could be a blessing to somebody who has nothing. Uh, Eric talked about his family members and uh, the two young children who now have no parents. See, when a kid has nobody, anything is valuable. You might have to take those kids in, Pastor Eric. That's something you might have to pray on. Now look at that. I just said that one to me. That's something you might you might have to become a daddy at 20, at 20. How old did you pass them? 21, uh-huh, amen. You been, watch out now, God might be sending that to you. Amen. <laughs> last thing, last thing. Turn with me to Romans 10 and 17. We're going to run through these quickly and we're going to get out of here. Rom Romans 10 and 17, somebody get James 2 and 14. Romans 10 and 17, somebody get James 2 and 14. Romans 10 and 17 says this. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith come by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The verse 18 says, but I say, have you not heard? Yes, verily I have heard the sound that went throughout all the earth. All right, so faith come by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Anybody got James 2.14? James 2.14. Okay, I got it. It says this. James 2.14 says this. What does it profit my brother? 
Though a man say he had faith and have not works, can faith sustain him? Next, go to uh, verse 17. Even so, if he hath not works, it is dead, being alone. Yea, a man say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show ye thee my faith by my works. We're going to put all that together in a second. We're going to put all that together in a second. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Faith without work is dead. All right, last night, uh, how many of y'all saw the fight last night? Tyson fought, I know y'all young, but Tyson fought, okay, so y'all saw the fight. Okay. Uh, there was another fight before the big fight. It was a fight with Nate Robinson and some white man, what's name? Jake Paul or something like that, some white dude named Jake Paul. Now, the interesting thing about the fight is Nate Robinson is a brother. So, most brothers say, I'll knock a white boy out all day long. What? Right now, anytime, anytime, come see me good right now on the hood. But anytime, and uh, most brothers have no fear, nobody white. Well, unless they're a police officer, then we get all, you know, we get scary then. We get real scary then. Anyway, this white guy got into the ring, and, and you ladies didn't see it, but he got into the ring, and he was all antsy. I told my daughter, look at him, he looked crazy. He was like, <laughs> he looked all crazy. And, and, they, and they strolled in the ring like a brother. You know, what's up? You know, he did it up. What's up? I got this white boy. He's about to go down. You know, and Snoop Dogg was on the mic like, this white boy about to go to sleep, cuz. This white boy. <laughs> it was all good. So the fight started. And it looked kind of weird. My wife, I, now, I've been married to this woman for 24 years. I have never seen this woman laugh that. She laughed for almost two hours. She was hot <laughs> on the rock. <laughs> Woo! She ain't never seen nothing that crazy in her life. She fell out. Because when, when two people, first of all, they weren't professional fighters. So you know how we fight in the hood. <laughs> you know, you just start swinging. All right. So it, looked, it didn't look right, you know. <laughs> but when they start swinging, White the boy. white boy closed his eyes, boom, and hit Nate. Now, I'm a brother. I felt some type of way, deep inside my heart. I felt a type of way. I, it hurt. I'm sorry, Pastor Eric. It hurt me. It, it, I felt like, oh, cuz. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> we, we can't. Hold on. And I went to the beach this morning. You should have seen that white boy looking at the brother. Mm -hmm. like, I, I was at the beach this morning. They were, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and they were looking at me. They were sizing me up this morning. And I was like, oh, no. It done gave white people courage. <laughs> we got to stop this blasphemy. <laughs> we got to stop this. Anyway, Nate went down, and the white boy knocked Nate down, was it three times? Three times. And the final time he knocked him out, it was so cold. I ain't never seen a brother put to sleep like that. He, he just kept down, and, and the brother was up. He was asleep when he hit the ground. He did boo boo. He did boo boo. I was like, oh, this is embarrassing. Now, here's what happened Nate had faith. Nate Robinson had faith. But the white guy had works. Think about that. Nate had faith. He stepped into the ring confident. But the white guy had works. Nate only started preparing for this fight in August, now you're a fighter, a couple of y'all boxers are out here. Some of y'all went to the ring. You know that as a train, you got to train for months. You got to get stamina. You got to work this thing out. You got to work, work, work. This white guy had been training for a whole year. Nate just started two months ago. Because Nate was like, I cannot get this a white boy. I got this. So what do we learn from this? Your works will validate your faith. If you have faith and no works, the Bible said it is dead. And I hate to say this, Nate looked like he died. I was scared there for a moment, but he didn't move for about 30 seconds. I was like, Nate was, he was asleep. He was literally gone. But the point is, you have to learn to back up what you say with works. What does that mean for you young people? <clears throat> If you want success, 
What are you doing to participate in that thing? If you want a good relationship, how are you preparing yourself for that? If you want a driver's license, what are you doing to get a driver's license? If you want a job, how are you preparing yourself for a job? If you want to own a house one day, what are the steps that you're taking to get to that direction? The point is, whatever it is that you say you want, you should have some works to validate that very thing. Because if you have no works, just like Nate fell out, you're going to get passed out. Because see, what Satan does is this. Satan is brilliant. Remember, Satan is God's most powerful creation. He is amazing. He is. It's the truth. What Satan will do is he will test your works. He will test your works. He will test your work. He will test the very thing that you say that you want to do. He will test it. He will, he will try it. He will push against it. He will try to break it down to see if it's hard and like it's supposed to be. So that's why you put in that work so that when Satan comes to test you, you can stand up to him and you can pass the test. But if he comes and he pushes against you and he finds a weakness, he will exploit you and bring you down. Everybody stand. Everybody grab a hand, grab a hand. Amen. All right, let's give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God says, and we didn't get to this today, but God says, you are an overcomer. You are an overcomer. You are an overcomer. How many of you ever survived something that you should not have? Raise your hand. Amen. That makes you an overcomer. And the beautiful thing about being an overcomer is this. If you are an overcomer, God says, he's already opened up the gates of heaven for you. Your name is already written in the book of life just by being an overcomer. What an overcomer is, is a person who doesn't quit when stuff gets hard. A person who keeps persevering even though it doesn't look like you can win. And you guys are the generation that they said would fail. You guys are the generation that they say wouldn't make it. The millennials or whatever they call you guys, Gen Z or whatever it is. But what you have is a connection with God. And if you keep that connection with God uh, strong, then he will make you an overcomer. And that means you will come, everything that you come against, you will conquer. You want to be a conqueror. You want to be an overcomer. You want to be one that doesn't quit when things get hard. You want to be one that uses God and say, if God be for me, nothing can be against me. See, I believe that. I'm so foolish, I believe.